morning, everyone. Good afternoon, wherever you are. This is Marshall McDonald talking with Bob Mover. Bob Mover is getting ready to open his online music academy, the Bob Mover Academy. And today we were going to talk about the great Luke Lee Konitz, who was one of my favorite saxophone players going back to when maybe I was 18 years old. How you doing today, Bob? I am fine, Marshall. And how are you, my friend? I'm doing all right, I guess. You, you know, the, the world's gone crazy, Bob. <laughs> the world's gone crazy, but you can be in Japan and I can be in New York City and we can be talking. How about that? Craziness, <clears throat> there's a, you know, my grandmother always said, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And uh, we need lemonade. We need, we need a lot of sugar in this world. We need a lot of sugar. Or honey. <laughs> Or whatever's going to sweeten it, because the world is not very sweet these days, is it? Maybe some artificial sweetener, too. <laughs> artificial sweetener? I'm not sure if that's good for you. <laughs> I don't like it. I think it causes you to, it causes your body to think that it's getting sugar. And I'm not into thinking, into fooling people. Right. <laughs> it's, it's really not a healthy thing. I don't use artificial sugar, actually. Yeah, because I think it fools the body to thinking it's getting sugar. And it goes, oh, give me that sugar. And then it says, it's not winning, but you're not sugar. So the, the first the first time I, I heard your playing was on, on a Lee Conus Bomb Mover recording. You were very young at the time. And then, of course, I began listening to some, some later sessions later. I really enjoyed enjoyed your work on the, especially the sessions on Chet Baker, which we'll talk about on a later date. But I'd like to know just in the beginning, what were lessons like with Lee Conitz? How did you meet Lee Conitz? Were you a protege? Did you hang out with him a lot? I only took one official lesson with Lee. And it wasn't really much of an official lesson. Um, how I met him was, uh, you know, you got to believe in karma in this world. And it's funny because one of the books that influenced me in my life, you and I have had talked about spiritual matters. Uh, a book that affected me profoundly is Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. And it was funny, one day I was walking down the street with uh, Autobiography of a Yogi and Walter Davis Jr. I ran into Walter in the middle of the street. This was in the 70s. When I first started to read the book, I was about 22, 23. And uh, well, I actually had read it earlier, but I was reading it. Walter said, oh, Autobiography of a Yogi. Man, Bird turned me onto that book. So it was interesting that Bird was also kind of uh, into it. And you know, aside from any uh, joining any organization or this type of thing, uh, what, what Yogananda was talking about was this really bringing home the idea of, of, of karma. He talks in, in about how if you believe in something very strongly and you put the idea in the world enough, it will manifest itself. And, you know, this doesn't happen consistently. If it happened consistently to me, then I probably would be, um, well, far more exalted than I am. And, uh, you know, but this, there are occasions in one's life where you go, you know what? I think there's something to this. So the way I met Lee Konitz, I believe, is, a, is an interesting example of how this happens in a universal sense, but in particular in my life. I was in Miami, where it was just one of the places I was raised. I was uh, 17 years old, uh, almost 18. Um, as a matter of fact, just about, I just turned 18, it was in March. And the uh, Easter vacation was coming at the University of Miami. When I was uh, in 17, I was a featured soloist with the University of Miami band under Jerry Coker, jazz band. Coker heard me at a session with Ira Sullivan and said, come on, you're gonna play in the university band. And he really encouraged me. So I was hanging out at the university a lot. I actually stopped going to high school at that point and just hung out at the university. So I was around there and I was, I was uh, playing in the band and teaching uh, the students there for $3 a lesson. I remember my first students, that was my first teaching experience. Excuse, anyway, me, Bob. Excuse me, Bob, what year was that for, for, for us? That was uh, 19... Um, 69. Oh, it was 1969. This was almost the beginning of jazz education in the schools with Jerry Cooker and David Baker and all those guys. This was one of the first uh, university bands. They had been they had been in Indiana, and Indiana, and I think maybe North Texas State or somewhere else were the first ones to have jazz departments. Mm -hmm. And David Baker and Cooker had started that at, in Indiana, and Jerry Cooker moved to Florida to start the University of Miami Jazz Department. Huh. which was only a year or two old at the time. And he brought with him Witt Seidner, who later became uh, the head of the department. Um, Gary Campbell, who we know is a wonderful saxophone player and a brilliant guy. And uh, also a guy named Jerry Green, 
who was Marshall, you would have loved Jerry Green. Jerry Green was a hell of an alto player. Huh. Um, he was a, a terrific player. Unfortunately, Jerry, I hope he's still alive, but he had a lot of um, mental problems. I guess you might call him what was what's now known as bipolar, and it got the best of him. Huh. So unfortunately, but uh, there is a book called Patterns for Jazz, which Coker wrote along with Jerry Green, Jimmy Casals, who was a wonderful saxophone player who died young, and Gary Campbell. Those are the four names in that Patterns for Jazz, which was the okay. first book after we, Oliver Nelson. We, we all had that book. I had that book and I, I, I practiced religiously with it at the University of Pittsburgh, but I never knew who Jerry Green was. The other guys I knew, I, I never knew who Jerry Green was. Yeah, we used to call him Bean, not because of Coleman Hawkins, but we called him, you know, Green Bean. Right. And, uh, Jerry was, uh, well, that's another topic, you know, and uh, in my, uh, I'm writing my memoirs in there, I kind of do, do a little bit about Jerry. Um, he came to New York for a short time, actually, in the 70s, and used to come and sit in with Tom Harrell, Tom Harrell and I, mm-hmm. and he was uh, playing tenor at that time. But he went back to, he was originally from, uh, from Georgia, hmm. and he went back to, uh, uh, to Georgia. But um, anyway, so I, I, I was playing with a drummer named Jimmy Chapek in Miami. Uh, who was working with Iris Sullivan, and we would get together and play duets for hours. And like I said, I just turned, I think I just turned 18. And Jimmy, I'd heard Lee Konitz with some of Tristano records that my friend Brooks Kerr, a uh, wonderful piano player who lived in New York and I, I'd known from, uh, you know, from before, had played for me. And I liked the Tristano music, but it wasn't quite what I was into at the time. I was into Horace Silver, I mean, I was into Bird. And I was into, you know, that, that type of stuff. And uh, I was into Sonny Rollins. And I couldn't quite make the, uh, I think the time feeling of Tristano music didn't, didn't really get me, you know. I, I got it later. I liked it better. But Jimmy said, are you hip to this guy? And he put on a record called Motion Lee, which is the trio record that Lee played uh, with Sonny Dallas on bass and Elvin Jones on drums. And when I heard ba ba ba, ba boo boo, bit booey, be da, ba be da da da, ba ba da da, you know, as soon as I heard that, um, I was I was enthralled. I said, "Wait a minute, what's this?" It was one of those really epiphanal moments. I said, "Wait, wait, who's this cat?" Um, the invention of it, the the pure improvisation that I heard going on was I just really started to get into Sonny Rollins seriously. And, and, and I, of course I was in love with Bird and, and still am. And there's no, you know, no question about that. But aside from that, I'd never heard somebody taking so many chances. Like, I, I mean, I loved Phil Woods and I loved Sonny Stitt and I loved Jackie McLean and, and Jackie took chances, so, you know, he did too. But the kind of really going out on a limb, you know, like the kind of way that, that Sonny was really the only guy I heard that took that kind of, those kind of chances to me and, and he was making it you know he was he was really putting his life on the line with every phrase and yet it was beautiful you know the way things hooked up the sensibility um plus i like the liner notes that he wrote on the record where he said that he was kind of happy about not having really made made it professionally but he said it gave because he said it gave him a chance to relax and get some insight into his life and later on in life i would really kind of understand that because I never really made it uh, professionally in the sense of the way a lot of people did. But yet I think I, it may have helped me in the end, you know, it's weird how that goes. But anyway, I was excited by the, the you know, the, the liner notes that he wrote and everything about it. And I said, I got to meet this guy, Lee Konitz. Now I happened to know, because I had lived in New York the year before and I had to move because of some family problems and this and that, but I'd gone back in the summer um, of 69 and I'd been in New York and hung out and lived there. I spent a lot of time uh, with Evelyn Blakey and Winton Kelly and Kenny Durham were often at her house and that's a different story. But Brooks Kerr, my close friend, was quite wealthy at the time. His family did actually lose their money in the end, but he had this beautiful townhouse. So I was often at Brooks's house and he had the best record collection in the world. Plus the Ellington band was always hanging out at Brooks's house. He was the world's foremost authority, even Stanley Dance admitted that Brooks probably knew more uh, than, than he did. Duke said, if you want to know something about my band, ask Brooks Kerr, he's our encyclopedia. So how, how'd you meet Lee Konis though? You know, this is what's kind of happening, yeah. So it's, it's, it's coming up. 
So now, the uh, I heard this record, and I saw the reason I, I knew Lee was in New York was because I'd lived in New York. I bought the Village Voice every week. And in the back of the Village Voice, there was an instruction section. So it said, instruction, it said Lee Konitz. And I knew that he was teaching in New York. In fact, I'll never forget his ad because it said Lee Konitz now teaching, um, accepting students, all instruments, all levels, advanced, intermediate, beginner, and tone deaf. That was what his ad said. So, so he, wasn't, I said, he wasn't working a lot then, if I remember. He, he was not working a lot. No, he had been, uh, he, he was scuffling. Yeah, he was really not doing too well. And um, so, so I said, you know, I've got to meet this guy. Now, it happened to be that I just happened to have the money to, to get to New York and have a few dollars in my pocket. My grandmother had given me a birthday present, so I had about 20 bucks to spend. And I had a few dollars from the, the $3 lessons I was giving. And there was a ride, round trip, going from the university. I looked on the bulletin board, ride to New York in a van, six people, $15 round trip, everybody. <laughs> We're going to stay for, for eight days in New York. So I called and I said, I got to take this ride up to New York. So he said, okay, we're leaving in three hours. Can you make it? So, you know, I grabbed a change of underwear basically and, uh, and just uh, my horn and took off. And so when we got to around Washington, DC, it occurred to me that I had forgotten to tell Brooks that I was coming in because I was going to stay at Brooks's house and he didn't even know I was on my way. So I said, oh, it would behoove me to call. There were no cell phones in those days, of course. For those of us who don't wouldn't know that, um, so we got to D.C. and I got to a payphone, and I took my quarters and put them all in and called Brooks and said, "Hey, Brooks." Now Brooks was blind, so that's an important part of the story as well. Brooks uh, had uh, very very little vision, tiny vision like Art Tatum. Um, he later lost his sight entirely, but at this point he had tiny vision. And I said, uh, "Brooks, I'm coming to New York," and uh, he said, "Sure." I said, "Can I stay with you?" He said, "Of course." He said, but may I ask you why the sudden, uh, you know, sudden impulse to move to New to come to New York for these these days? I told him about Lee Konitz. I said, I got to meet Lee Konitz. I heard this record. I'm crazy about it. I got to meet this cat. It's like, you know, and I read his teaching. So I'm going to call him when I get in and ask him for a lesson. And, you know, I, I don't know what he charges. And Brooks says, don't worry. If you don't have it, I'll give you the rest of it. You know, because Brooks was that kind of guy. So I said, great. Brooks said, listen, when you get here, though, I may not be here. I'm going to leave the key in a special place. He told me where he's going to leave the key. But I'm going out to the half note to hear Roy Eldridge. So I said, oh, um, all right. Well, you know, he said, look, let yourself in. You know where the liquor cabinet is and blah, blah, blah. And uh, make yourself a drink. And I'll be home about two in the morning or something like that. You know, I'm going to catch the music down at the half note. So I said, cool. OK. So I got there about one in the morning, got into New York, got into Brooks's apartment. I'm laying back with the scotch in Brooks's living room, listening to some, you know, some Coleman Hawkins. And uh, Brooks opens the door and he's got the head. He looks like the cat that ate the canary. And he says, uh, Bob, you're not going to believe what happened tonight. I said, what happened? He said, well, I sat at the bar at the half note. I was listening to Roy. And between sets, I struck up a conversation with the guy next to me at the bar. And he was very erudite. He knew a lot about Roy. In fact, he knew a lot about the music. I mean, this guy really knew. So we had a lovely conversation for about you know 20 minutes. And I asked him finally, I said, you know, you really seem to know about this music. I, uh, what's your name? He said, oh, I'm Lee Konitz. It was Lee Konitz. He said, here's an address. He says, come to this address in the village tomorrow at four o'clock. You'll be his last student of the day at Dick, Pe Dick Katz's studio. So I had Lee Konitz's address from Brooks going to the club that night, to the bar, the, the half note. Next. <laughs> I'm sorry. There you go. So you said you only took one lesson with Lee, or you hung out with yeah. Lee. How, yeah, that was how much Lee. did you learn from Lee? How did you learn it? Uh, uh, how did you reach the point where he wanted to record? A, he said, "Okay, I'll record a record with you." By the old-fashioned way of apprenticeship, Lee said to me, "I took one lesson. I, I took this lesson, uh, and it was a beautiful lesson." Lee said, uh, "Play something." So I played Lush Life for him. He said, that's beautiful. Now play something with some rhythm. So I played I'll Remember April. 
and I played in G. He said, uh, he said, that's nice. He said, can you play it in D flat? So I played it in D flat. They said, can you play it in E? And then I played it in E. And he said, can you play it this tempo? I played it there. He said, can you play it? Ooh, do, dee, dee. Can you play it as a waltz? So I spent an hour playing it. I remember April. And then he took his horn out and we played duets on I remember April. So there I was blowing with him and, and in different keys on I remember April and everything. He would, then he shifted keys without telling me where he was going. And this is my first lesson, you know, I'm there and we do that. And then at the end of the lesson, Dick Katz walks in and Lee says, hey, now you can play it with a piano player. <laughs> so Dick Katz sat down and we played it together. And not to blow my old horn, Lee said, you know, I've never had a lesson like this. He said, you're the most brilliant student I've ever had. I said, wow. He said, you really have worked very hard at this music. He said, you're really serious about this. I said, it's my whole life, of course. He said, you know, and, and I said, I said, I came from, I told him the story of how I got there and everything. I said, you know, it's weird that I, I told him all about Miami and the ride and then Brooks meeting him. And, and so he said, that's fantastic. And he said, well, I said, well, I, I've got to pay you something. He said, I said, how much do you charge? And Lee said, well, I charged, I think it was $25. And I said, you know, Lee, I have like $17 and Brooks, uh, I have like $15 or something like that. And Lee said, yeah, you know what? 15 is cool. Don't worry about it. He said, I'm so broke right now. It doesn't matter. And I remember we talked about things and I said, Lee, you know, one of the things I really respect about you is that you don't play on the Merv Griffin show or the Tonight Show and you don't, you could, but you know, I studied Richie Kamuka. I'd already studied, lived in New York and studied with Richie and Al Cohen and I'd had some experience. I played with Roy Eldridge by that time too. I was only 18, but I'd had, at Zoot, I knew all those guys and I played, in, played with them when I was 16. So, so it wasn't, you know, my first experience playing with a great player and I played with Iris Sullivan since I was 16, 15. So, um, you know, but Lee said, uh, well, you, um, he, I said, you know, you don't do that. You know, you just play jazz. I said, and I, I just respect that so much. And Lee said, I hate to burst your bubble, my man. But, uh, you know, if the Merv Griffin show called me tomorrow, I would have my clarinet out and I'd be learning some flute and I would do it. He said, because, you know, this jazz life is, is starting to get to me. He says, I can't get the gigs, right. you know, and very difficult. And he started telling me how difficult it was and how much you have to sacrifice to do this. And we talked about that. Anyway, I, um, he, and then he said, listen, I got a new record out and it was the Lee Konitz duet record on, on uh, uh, you know, it was that Milestone record, I think. And uh, the Cats had produced it, I think. And he gave me the record even. I paid him the $15 for the lesson. He gave me a free record to take with me. So how, how old were you then when you met Lee Konitz? 18. You were 18? I had turned, I had turned 18 the week before. And when, when did you, uh, when did someone tell you to start learning tunes in different keys and to do stuff in 12 keys, stuff like that? I just knew to do that. Well, how did well, you, I would, no, you must've been, you must've been, but you must've been playing with some musicians that were more advanced with you that could help you, guide you into what you're going to do, right? Was well, it Ira, would, Ira Sullivan? Ira Sullivan and Joe DiOrio, the great guitarist, were in Florida and they had the steady gig for years at a place called the Rancher Lounge, five nights right. a week. Mm -hmm. And I would sit in with them. I would sneak, I would wait till the owner went home and then they'd sneak me into the club and they'd often let me play the last set with them. So they would do that. They would call, you know, all of a sudden you'd be, uh, you know, they, they'd call Khan Alma on me one night, man. And I'd never played Khan Alma. And boy, did I step all over myself. I was trying to find where it started. Right. I knew it was sort of like confirmation. You know, I could hear that the first change or there will never be another youth that went into the relative minor and then it resolved to a key that seemed like a major third away. I wasn't sure. But, you know, Ira told me, who, another guy who didn't technically know music, that tunes went to different keys. So you got to know kind of there's a tonic and the tunes move around. So I knew that much. And uh, I, I studied with Phil Woods for the summer in, uh, in New, New Hope, Pennsylvania at this camp, Ramblerney where Roger Rosenberg went and Michael Brecker went. And, uh, you know, it was a fast company in that place, Richie Cole. I've seen pictures of that, pictures of them all there. And, and 
I know about Gary Campbell. He was involved with the Loft Sessions in, in New York. Gene Perla has some of the recordings online now. Gary was very influential, actually, to Michael Brecker, along with... Uh, well, Mark, they used to have those with, with Liebman. Liebman and, and Grossman. And Gary was in New York in that summer. He was in the summer of 67, 69. Right. Gary he recorded at, the, at Gene Perla's Loft a little a little bit during that summer. Gene has them posted on a on an educational website now. Yeah, Perla had a loft and Liebman had a loft that Mike Brecker later took over. God. And there were a few different lofts. There were also after hour sessions at the uh, at the top of the gate, the village gate. And these guys were playing mostly free. And then there was the band Dreams that was starting to rehearse. And uh, Sanborn was in that. That was where he was first uh, in that. And a, a couple of times I subbed and I, I hated it. I, I had the worst time in that band. It was so loud that I like it was right. it was it was much too much for me. But anyway, that was that was I mean, I love the musicianship. Everybody was great. Yeah, that, but the, that, the, the that, volume. Post that post Coltrane thing, Grossman was probably the, uh, the the top of the pack. I think he was the most advanced player out of the whole crowd at the youngest age. I, I, I've, I've heard from well, many players in New York. Well, I knew Steve when he played alto and sounded like Phil Woods when he was yeah. when he was uh, 17. Yeah. We, we were, uh, you know, uh, that's another but, story. But he, we, I think he got the gig with Miles at 18 on Soprano. He, he definitely had adopted some Coltrane somewhere along the line. Well, he had a lot of Coltrane. No, he did. He did do that. When he switched to tenor, that's when he played like train. But who was the most advanced, I thought, in some ways, or who played the best middle period train of everybody was Bob Berg. It was a little uh, later, though. Lee, Lehman and Grossman were... From the tapes, and even as Lehman said, were yeah, Lehman ahead of like, everyone else at the time. Yeah, Bob Berg came on a little bit more like the early seventies. Yeah, Bob was Lee, Lehman's the oldest, I think, right? Lehman was the oldest. Yeah, and then there was uh, there was Steve Grossman and Brecker, and Gary Campbell was around, and I was around uh, with with some of those sessions. Right. I would play um, when they did the free stuff and that kind of stuff. I didn't do that much of that. But Brecker and I were like freaking frack. We went to a lot of places together. Right. And, uh, you know, um, that was, uh, so we, we made a lot of those sessions. I, I made some of those. So you know. Lee, Lee uh, more so than you being a, a student of Lee, he became a major influence for your playing. And before that, you, you must have started saxophone somewhere around the age of 10 or nine or something like that. No, I was 13. 13. Yeah, but I, I practiced a lot. Did you have a teacher or how, how did that work? For you? Uh, well, I did. Let me just one thing about Lee, though. The other thing about the um, the thing of being influenced by Lee is after that, um, you know, when I when I left New York and, and I came back a few years later, but we wrote <laughs> letters to each other. He wrote me letters and I wrote him letters. We had a correspondence and uh, I would ask him questions about music and, and that kind of thing. You know, I had certain things about and he, he was not specific about changes. He wouldn't talk to me about harmony so much. He said, you got to learn to just play melodically. You know, he was very much about that. And then he said, we'll send you to Lenny at some point. But he started to let me sit in with him um, more. Like whenever I'd be, when he would play at the half note, he would have me, he'd let me play like the whole last set with him, another person who would, would do that. So I learned by on the bandstand with him and I go to his house and we'd play duets. And uh, we take walks in Central Park with his dog, Jingo Weinhardt, was the name of his dog. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so we would, we would, you know, we became friends. And, um, you know, I mean, I considered it studying with him. Um, you know, so I, um, I moved to Boston when I was 18. Well, I, I spent the summer when I was 18 in New York and went over to his house four or five times a week. And then Jackie Byard, I met Jackie Byard, and he said I should come to Boston and play with him. And uh, I went to his class at New England Conservatory. He considered me a teaching assistant because I wasn't an official student, but that's another story. But um, as you were saying, um, uh, when I started to play, I had already been able to sing all these Charlie Parker solos and Lester Young and Stan Getz, those were three of the solos I hadn't, and I could sing Miles Davis's whole Roundabout Midnight record, including Coltrane solos. 
I could sing everybody's solos. I could sing Bud Powell, the amazing Bud Powell, the record from beginning to end. I could, uh, I spent all day singing and I didn't know. And I started to sing songs. I could sing standards and I would sing for the neighbors. And uh, then my voice changed. When I was about 12, I started to sing like alfalfa. I'm in the mood or love. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden I said, well, I want to play an instrument. And so the saxophone was the closest thing to the human voice to me. And my dad was a trumpet player and I didn't want to compete with him. And I tried to be, he was a very bad teacher, my dad. So he was, a, I played a little trumpet and I didn't want to go near that anymore. Um, but the saxophone seemed like an interesting thing to do. And so that was what I did. And for the day I got it, I practiced eight to, to sometimes 12 hours a day. And uh, I was, uh, rarely in school, or if I was in school, I made friends with the band teacher who like, would just let me play in the band room or it was in Miami. I'd go out on the football field okay. and, and play while they had to, I wouldn't go to classes. So that's basically the key I was looking for because you, no, no one becomes a, a, a great player with a lot of, a lot of, a lot of practice and a lot of uh, usually some good guides to guide us. And I, I, I want to wrap up this, this moment about this, this moment about Lee Konitz it's clear that you the spending all that time with them, although it wasn't formal lessons, you were you were basically becoming like Jackie McLean was to Charlie Parker. Just, just the fact of of being with the man and absorbing the music and playing with the person is taking lessons with someone, basically. You know, oh yeah. And is, the thing was know, in fact, it's probably better than taking lessons with someone because now you've become a, a how do you say a, a, almost like a Zen you're a small Zen part of the whole being of, of Lee Konitz. And that, that's really what developed your playing. That's the key you know? to it, that Zen thing, you know, because it's really, I mean, people throw that term around, you know, but uh, with Ira Sullivan, Ira taught me what it was to be mentored. Because I met Ira when I was 13, he was 34. And tell me how many 34 year old guys are gonna hang out after the gig talking about music, life, and everything under the sun, Jesus Christ, the Bible. I mean, um, um, sure. not just that, but I mean, Eastern philosophy, um, you know, Henry Miller, I mean, and uh, Charlie Parker, yeah, that, and all these, uh, Clifford Brown, that's and what those, until those the sun great, came up. That's what those great jazz hangs were about. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up this moment, which it seemed to be a, maybe a, maybe a 30 minute moment. <laughs> So we're going to, I thought it was an interesting idea, you know, I mean, right. And, uh, you know, that, um, you know, that covers that, but I never can, I, I know someday we'll talk about Ira, but All I know right. I, you know, they both died last year and I'm still feeling it. Well, let me, I, I think we should talk about that in more depth. Let, let me, let me wrap this one up. And we're going to we're going to have another session later on. I think about Chet Baker. But until then, it's been a moment with Bob Mover talking about the great Lee Konitz, and it, it the Lee Konitz record with Elvin Jones was one of the first ones that I went and bought too. I also had a friend who was very much into the Lenny Trishano school in the high school I went to. So he he wow. was Andy Fight who now lives in, in Sweden. He was deeply into it. So he had every single record, and I, I was his roommate once. So. You know, so and I got. got I, I, I really enjoyed. Uh, uh, it, 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 to tell you the truth, a lot of black players were had an antithesis about that whole school, but I, I found it quite fascinating. And I understand at the time they did. I I I know that Charlie Parker loved Lee Konitz, and I used to tell people that. You know, he played with Lenny. He, he enjoyed because there was a moment in time when when music. You remember when jazz music became a certain race division? Remember that time? Yeah, oh, I and remember. I, I think it happened I, more in my lifetime. I think if you could, you could say more, but when Martin Luther King was killed, mm -hmm. there was a, a definite feeling among a lot of black people that uh, white guys shouldn't be playing this. Go play your own music. Go play right. your Beethoven, your Bach, right. and this and that. Which brings me to another story, which I think you might in this in this context. I want to tell it to you. And we can use it some other time or whatever. Well, give, give me a second. Let, let me close up this moment. And we're gonna um, we're going to pause for just a little bit of time and go get some some juice and some drink. And we'll see you in the next minute. This is Marshall McDonald. I'll see you on the next time with Bob.
Good morning, Vietnam. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Good morning, everybody. Today we're with Bob Mover, who's starting his opening his online music academy shortly, and I'm proud to say he's asked me to be a member of the faculty there. It looks like a really good thing is coming with this take two. I don't like that. Give me one second.